right, Matthew 21, 18. I don't know what kind of vocations you all have worked in or been in before, but if you want to excel in any of those, there are certain characteristics that you need to embody. For example, basketball. I hear there was a basketball game or two on last night. I don't know. That's just what I hear. I don't know. If you want to excel in basketball, you need to be tall and athletic and competitive, right? If you want to excel in education, I know we got lots of teachers, you need to be able to multitask and communicate well and understand and be able to do about 14 things at once while a kid's crying in your face. If you want to excel in engineering, you need to be able to do math and to think critically. And, and so I want you to think about what that is for you in your own job, in your own vocation, the things you do. There are certain sets of, of characteristics that people need to embody to excel in those things. So we think about that and think about our Christian life. What is that like for the Christian? What characteristics embody Jesus' people? I mean, truthfully, we could sit here and list off lots of them today, but, but today, we're, as we continue our study of Matthew and, and Jesus last week, we're going to zero in on two such characteristics uh, that, that embody Jesus' people. So if you would, Matthew 21 uh, read along in your own Bibles, I read aloud. Matthew 21, 18. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say that this mountain be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. This, this strange little story here, and it's a strange little story, let's admit that, couched here in Jesus last week, reveals two characteristics that I think Jesus' people should embody. And the first one is that Jesus' people are fruit-bearing. Jesus' people bear fruit. So first, a little bit of background, right? Jesus has come to Jerusalem, this for his last week, uh, for the Passover. And the city here was so packed with visitors that Jesus and his disciples had to stay outside the city, right? You've been to a, a, a city and try to stay in a hotel, and the hotels were packed, and so you had to stay a little bit outside of town. That's what Jesus and his disciples did. They stayed right outside of town in a place called Bethany, maybe at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. And in the morning, they, they got out of the house and they journeyed back to the city. Along the way, Jesus gets hungry. It's breakfast time. And he sees a fig tree by the wayside. Uh, and Mark's account of the story tells us that it wasn't technically the season for figs, but this particular tree had some leaves on it, so, uh, so he walks towards it. Now, I don't know much about fig trees, okay? That, that's not in my forte of knowledge here, but, uh, but I've read that fig trees, leaves, and fruit appear about the same time. Is that right? Am I, am I on track here? Y'all can tell me if I'm wrong. So generally, if there are leaves on a fig tree, it means there are fruit. So Jesus sees the fig tree, it's got some leaves, he walks to it, and there are no fruit. There's no figs, there's just the leaves. So Jesus says, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the tree withers and dies. Well, there we go. Uh, we're going to pray and conclude now. I'm just kidding. This is a strange story, right? What is this, what is this doing in the Bible? This is rather uncharacteristic for Jesus. I mean, I, I get when you get a little hungry, you get grouchy. Uh, I've been there, right? But still, what is the deal with Jesus cursing the fig tree? Well, most of the time when Jesus wants to, to make a point, he tells a story, doesn't he? And Jesus was a masterful storyteller. He was a great storyteller. His stories and parables are some of the best of all time. But occasionally when Jesus makes a point, he doesn't tell a story. He acts out a story. He, he seizes an opportunity around him to teach something very deep and very meaningful. 
And that's what's going on here. Jesus here is not dispensing divine gardening advice. I'm sure if you, if you farm or you garden, you would like some tips on divine weed cursing, okay? That's not, that's not the point of our passage. This is, Jesus isn't teaching us how to, how to curse plants. Jesus is not advocating that we get angry when we're hungry. Jesus here is teaching his disciples. He's teaching us a really important lesson. See, the fig tree had leaves. The fig tree had the appearance of bearing fruit. When you got a little closer, when you looked a little harder, there was no fruit to be found. The fig tree, the fig tree was putting on a facade. Does that sound a little bit familiar? If you've been tracking with us through Matthew. The passage just prior here, Jesus had just been in the temple. The people in the temple had the appearance of bearing fruit. There was worship. There were sacrifices going on all around. When you got a little closer, when you looked a little harder, there was, there was no fruit to be found. There were money changers and pigeon sellers there extorting the poor. There were people crowding out the Gentiles so they couldn't worship. And the people in the temple, like the fig tree, were putting on a facade. Immediately after that, Jesus had encountered chief priests and scribes. They too had the appearance of bearing fruit. They were the best of the best. They were the religious leaders. When you got a little closer, and you looked a little harder, there was no fruit to be found. These religious experts were suspicious of the very Messiah they'd been waiting for. They were contemptuous for the very God they claimed to worship. These religious leaders also, like the fig tree, were putting on a facade. It's kind of like the first time I saw a NASCAR. Right? Uh, I used to watch NASCAR a lot. I, I, I don't watch it as much. My brother's more into it, more in tune than I am. But I remember the first time I saw a NASCAR in person. I think we were at the beach, some beach, and, and at a restaurant they had a, a Jeff Gordon number 24 DuPont Chevrolet. I think it was a Chevy, Chevy Monte Carlo there on display outside the restaurant. And I was in awe. I mean, I wasn't a Jeff Gordon fan, but it didn't matter. I, this was a beautiful car, and I was so impressed. And I, I'd always watched NASCAR on TV, and the models looked just like the thing you bought at the dealership. Chevy Monte Carlo, Ford Taurus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as I got a little closer, I looked a little harder at this NASCAR. I saw there was no, this was not a dealership car. There was no grill on the front. That was a sticker. Those weren't real headlights. Those were stickers too. When you compare this NASCAR with what was in the dealership, this NASCAR was a very expensive facade. It was not the real thing. It's kind of like this fig tree. Kind of like these people. Jesus then is saying, when you have the appearance of spirituality and godliness, right? You have the leaves. But you don't have the fruit. You are a hypocrite. And just like that fig tree, Jesus cursed that fig tree and it withered and died. A day of judgment is coming. And that will happen for us. Jesus doesn't care about appearances. He doesn't care about how we look. He cares about realities. Jesus' is true people don't just have the leaves. They've got the fruit. So maybe you're wondering this morning, what does that mean to bear fruit? I mean, does it have to, have to eat apples and oranges a lot? What, what are we talking about? Does bearing fruit mean that I have to be really good and try really hard for Jesus to save me? No. Fruit, good deeds, doesn't save you because you can never produce enough good fruit. The fruit is simply the evidence that you've already been saved. You've already admitted your sin. Turn from it and turn towards Jesus. Here's what it means to bear fruit. To bear fruit means that your life gives clear, visible evidence that Jesus has already saved your soul. To bear fruit means that your life gives clear, visible evidence that the Holy Spirit lives within you, is indwelling you, and is changing you. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you have it all together. It does mean, though, that the general trajectory of your life it's towards Christ-likeness. The general bend of your life is not towards yourself. It's towards Him. 
And it's that your life tends to produce the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians 5. The love, the joy, the peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let's think about ourselves. We're here on a Sunday morning. We've got our nice church clothes on, right? Just, I never wear ties outside of church. This is, I'm dressed up. Right? We spend a little extra time on our hair. We sprayed ourselves with that little bit of something nice. Right? We, we have our smiles on. We're looking pretty good. But if we were to get a little closer, look a little harder, if we were to move beyond the superficial stuff here, what would we find? Would we find fruit? Would we find fruit in your life? If we were to ask your co-workers, would they say you have fruit in the workplace? If we were to ask your neighbors, would they say you have fruit? If we were to consult your, your browsing history, your, your credit card account, or your check log, would those things say you have fruit? Here's the kicker. If we were to ask your spouse or your, your children or your parents, would they say you have fruit? Because here's the deal. Just a few days after Jesus curses this tree, Jesus would hang from a cross. He would be beaten. He would be spit on. He would be nailed and humiliated. And he did not do this so that we could claim to be Christians and live the same way. He did not do this so we could put on nice clothes and fake holiness once a week. Jesus did this so we could be made right to the Father, be saved from eternal judgment, and be given the Holy Spirit. And he did this that we would bear the fruit of love and joy in the home. Of peace and patience in the checkout line. Of kindness and goodness in the workplace. Or the classroom. Whatever it is you spend your time. Or faithfulness and gentleness with those wayward family members. Or self-control at the buffet counter. Fruit, good deeds, is the mark of true faith. Are you bearing fruit? The first thing we see here is Jesus' people are fruitful. They bear fruit. Secondly, Jesus' people are faithful. Look here again at verse 20. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? Jesus answered them, Truly, I say to you, if you have faith, do not doubt. You will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up, and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So the disciples here see what Jesus did, and uh, characteristically, they are more impressed with the fig tree dying than with the meaning of it all, right? I think we can identify with that. Let's give them a break. But, but right before their eyes, this perfectly healthy fig tree had rotted up and, and gone away. So they asked Jesus, how did this happen, Jesus? And Jesus answered them. He says, look, if you have faith, and if you don't doubt, you'll not only be able to do this, you can, you can take that mountain and throw it into the sea. And I can imagine him pointing to the Mount of Zion and, and pointing over to the direction of the Dead Sea and saying, you can take that mountain and throw it in the sea. And he concludes by saying, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Jesus here is saying, his people are faith-filled. They are prayerful. Before we dig into the meat of what Jesus means here, and what he says here, let's make sure we define the terms. What is faith, first of all? A lot of times we talk about faith like it's this wishy-washy hope in yourself. Right? You've got to have faith in yourself. Or it's this wishy-washy hope that things will get better, right? Just have faith that it's all going to get better. That's not faith. Faith is, is a trust in the concrete realities of who Jesus was and what he did on the cross. That he died and that he rose again. That's faith. 
And the second thing we need to define is doubt. What is doubt? When Jesus says, uh, if you have faith and don't doubt, what is that? Doubt here, he's not talking about those fears and those questions that you have sometimes. And, and you direct them towards God. If you read the Psalms, you'll see that David had a lot of fears and a lot of questions that he directed towards God. That's not the issue. The issue here is doubt for doubt's sake. It's a, it's a decision to live and to function as if God didn't exist. That, that's the doubt he's talking about, and Jesus is not encouraging us to doubt. So Jesus seems to be telling his disciples, if you have this concrete hope in me, if you kick away this notion that I'm not who I say I am, and if you manifest this faith in prayer, big things are going to happen. Mountain moving size things. This is, this is a beautiful comforting truth because Jesus equips his disciples and us to do big things through his power. He wants us to come to him and pray. David Platt uh, is an author and the head of the International Mission Board. He was at Southeastern's Chapel this week. He said, Our Heavenly Father delights in those who are bold enough to bother Him. Jesus is calling His people to be faith-filled prayer warriors. But let's be honest here. Have you, have you ever prayed this kind of prayer? Prayed for a loved one. You prayed for a situation. You prayed this kind of prayer, and there were no mountains that moved. There were, there were no fig trees that changed. You prayed this prayer, and the situation didn't resolve itself. What you prayed for did not happen. I think, I think we've all been there before, and you know, we mentioned earlier about this little girl at Edward Best who passed away this week. This Friday, Miss Peggy and I went with some other pastors to the school and we prayed with the teachers. And we, we prayed for them, but, but there, was, there was nothing I could pray that would bring this little girl back. How do we reconcile what Jesus says here about the power of prayer with what all of us have experienced in our daily lives? To answer that question, let's, let's think ahead a few days in Jesus' life. Think ahead to the night before he was condemned, the night that Jesus took his disciples up to Gethsemane. And there in Gethsemane, he prayed fervently all night. Drops of blood poured from his face out of the stress and the anguish of the prayer. And he prayed this prayer, Matthew 26, 39. My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus, Jesus prayed he would not have to die this way. He prayed he wouldn't have to suffer. Jesus did not want the cross. But right after that, he prayed this. Nevertheless, it's not as I will, but as you will. Jesus didn't want the cross, but he prayed the Father's will above all. And if Jesus had to pray that God's will be done, we're not above our Savior. We do pray boldly. We do pray fervently. We pray audacious prayers. But we also pray them that God's will be done. Maybe you're wondering then, if it's all God's will, what's the point? Why do we need to pray? If God's going to do what He's going to do, why does He need me to pray? There are a couple answers to that question. For one, sometimes prayer isn't about what we get. It's about the relationship we have with God in the process. David Platt, again, says it better than I can. The primary purpose of prayer is not to get something, but to be with someone. We pray because we get to be with God. But we also pray because that's what God's called us to do. We pray because our prayers are the means by which God acts. 
God acts through our prayers. There's a reason why Jesus retreated all the time to spend time in prayer. There's a reason that big things always happen in the church in the Acts after extended seasons of prayer. There's a reason that Peter tells pastors to be devoted to ministry of the word and to prayer. It's because prayer is not wasted time. Prayer does stuff. I'll use an example to, to flesh this out. Any of you ever heard of the Moravians before? The Moravians. The Moravians were a small community of Christians in Germany. There were about 300 of them in, in the year 1727. In 1727, with this 300 Moravians, they were racked by division and by bickering. They didn't get along. But they had this revival going on. And on August 27th of 1727, 24 men and 24 women committed to praying one hour of every day. They started this round-the-clock prayer cycle, this round-the-clock prayer watch. And this prayer watch went nonstop for a hundred years. Somebody from that community prayed every hour of the day for one hundred years. About 65 years into this hundred-year prayer vigil, someone did the math. They discovered that this small community had sent out 300 missionaries. 300 people in 1727. 65 years later, they'd sent out 300 people to spread the gospel. Lest we ever doubt prayer does stuff. Prayer does stuff. Church, what would happen if we devoted ourselves to prayer? What would happen if we prayed bold, sloppy, mountain-moving-sized prayers? What would happen if we felt comfortable enough to bother God with our prayers? To that point, what's going to be here in a couple weeks? Well, that's true. Naturally, I pray. I hadn't thought about that one, but hey, that's who said that? Who said? Oh, that's right. Not yet. See, not yet. Okay, I've been. I'm getting in trouble with the association there. Okay. Wasn't the intention of this. But anyway, National Day of Prayer is coming up. But also Easter. And I imagine on Easter there are going to be people here at our church who would never grace the door of a church again. What if we prayed for them now? What if we prayed for them in advance? What if we prayed that God would open their eyes to their sinfulness? He would open their eyes to the good news that Jesus lived, that he died, that he rose again, that God would save them from their sins if they repent and believe. What might happen if we prayed today for the people who will be sitting in the pews beside you on Easter? Another example. The baptismal. I don't even know when the last time it was used. Before my time. Deacons and I were talking the other day. We joked that we're not even sure if the hot water works. <laughs> what if we prayed God would save someone's soul this year? We would have to turn that hot water on. Amen. What if we prayed that a revival would begin right here in Cedar Rock? Will you join me in praying for these things? Will you join me in your own homes and praying for these things? Will you join me this Wednesday night as we pray for these things? When you look at what a Christian should look like, you could think of a lot of things. You could think of um, willing to serve, humble. You know, the list could go on. But chief among them, what a Christian should do and look like would be fruit-bearing. A Christian bears fruit. And faith-filled. A Christian has faith and praise. This morning, do you bear fruit? Are you committed to prayer? Let's conclude in prayer. Father God, I pray that we would be a people who bear fruit. That we would be a people that live according to how Christ has called us to live when he changed us and called us into his church. God, I pray that we will be a people committed to prayer. 
I pray specifically for this Easter that there would be people here who have never heard the gospel that they would repent and believe for the first time. God, we pray that this year we would be able to turn the baptismal waters again and immerse someone in the water representing the fact that they have turned from their sins and turned towards you. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have called us to these great and these wonderful and these beautiful things. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.